Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Stanen, and I'm a librarian at the Nanaimo Wellington branch of the Vancouver Island Regional Library. And I'm so delighted to welcome you to today's special event, Eden Robinson, Reading and Conversation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging how grateful I am to be here today on the traditional territory of the Snunemo and Snunamas First Nations. Um, and I invite each of you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on today and every day. Before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping items to run through. So a quick reminder that we are recording this event. However, rest assured, you, uh, your camera and microphone will be turned off the whole time. Our Zoom settings have taken care of that. And um, the recording is not going to capture any usernames or any of the chat. We'd also like to remind you that the Vancouver Island Regional Library carries all of Eden Robinson's many wonderful books. And for a limited time, the Trickster series, as well as Monkey Beach, are available to borrow as ebooks with no wait times, which is pretty awesome. Um, and if you prefer to purchase copies of her books, though, we encourage you to do your shopping at the wonderful Indigenous owned independent bookstore, Strong Nations. And we're going to drop the link to both the Strong Nations and our catalog um, links uh, in the chat for you. Finally, we are going to be taking your questions. So um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll uh, try to get to as many of those as possible. So now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to my wonderful colleague and librarian, Darby Love. I'm Darby Love. I'm an adult services librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library. I cleaned my office for you folks. It normally is much more cluttered. And I'm really, really happy that we're able to welcome Eden Robinson. She's a Heisla Heltzik novelist, the author of a collection of novellas written when she was a goth called Trap Lines, which won the Winifred Holtby Prize in the UK. Her next novels, Monkey Beach and Blood Sports, were written before she discovered she was gluten intolerant and tend to be quite grim if you've read them. The latter being especially gruesome because halfway through writing it, Robinson gave up a two pack a day cigarette habit and the more she suffered, the more her characters suffered. Even so, Monkey Beach won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize and was a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and the Governor General's Award for Fiction. By the time Eden began, began her trickster trilogy, however, she'd given full reign to her matriarchal tendencies, which I think we're going to ask you about. And her first book, Son of a Trickster, in that series became a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and Canada Reads Trickster Drift, the second book in the trilogy, won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. And in 2017, Eden was awarded the Writer's Trust Fellowship. The third and final book in the trilogy, Return of the Trickster, is a national best speller. Ugh, seller. Welcome, Eden. Yay! <laughs> I just know I'm not as funny as you reading that, so a bit of pressure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my so, goodness! Um, do you, would you like to start by reading us a, a, your first selection? Yes, I, I, the the trilogy is narrated by a young man named Jared Martin. Uh, Jared Martin believes that his father is Philip Martin, and uh, his mother is Maggie Moody. Uh, but throughout the, the course of the first book, Son of a Trickster, he realizes that you know he is the son of a trickster named Weekend. He is the high slow trickster at Transform Raven. And um, uh, things kind of explode towards the end of the novel, and he it, uh, goes from not believing in magic at all to believing magic exists, but not really wanting anything to do with it because it's so crazy. Uh, in the second book, Trickster Drift, uh, it's exactly a year later, and he moves down to Vancouver to pursue his dream of uh, getting into the medical sonography program at BCIT. And, uh, you know, he's, he's not only avoiding magic, he's also been sober for a year. And, you know, he's had so much drama in his life that all he wants is like a nice, stable, secure, you know, job and future. And uh, so, but when he gets to Vancouver, he realizes that <laughs> the rents are much higher than he was anticipating. So he moves in with his estranged aunt Maeve, who is a writer. 
and she introduces him to a lot of family that he didn't even know about. So he's so in Trickster Drift, he's reconnecting and trying to build a future. Uh, but one of the people that he's trying to reconnect with is his, uh, his aunt Georgina, who is also known as Jawasons, who is Wiget's sister. And as it turns out, uh, she's been using bad magic and has it has transformed her into, oh, so, oh spoiler alert! <laughs> I'm really bad at spoiling things, though. So. Uh, so it turns out she's an ogress and she's married into a clan of koi wolves. And at the end of Trickster Drift, uh, to save his family from being uh, brought into all of this craziness, Jared takes the Ogus and her Koi Wolf clan to another universe. And they're all marooned there. At the very, very end, Jared gets free and uh, comes back to our universe. So Return of the Trickster opens two hours after he returns. Uh, chapter one, Sloppy Dead. The IV drip cold into Jared Martin's arm a remarkably grounding sensation. Saline. He remembered the nurse telling him he was dehydrated and that he kept throwing up the water they gave him. Bile scorched the back of his throat and unseen ambulance warbled, growing louder. The lights were achingly bright. The hospital mattress was firm against his back and the pale curtains surrounding his bed were shut. Through these fabric walls, he could hear other patients in the Kitimat General Hospital Emergency Ward, murmuring with their families, friends, lovers. A scream cut through the quiet as electric doors swooshed open somewhere near, bringing the smell of rain then closed. Voices shouted information and instructions at each other as a lone male voice howled, guttural. He shivered. Nausea hit again. Jared's stomach cramped. The nurse had given him a little cardboard container for his vomit, but it was full and pungent, reeking on the medical table. Jared slid off the bed. The floor was cold against his bare feet. He yanked off the clear tape that held the IV in place and carefully pulled out the needle. The other bed curtains were shut. But through the gaps, he could see the patients listening intently as another male voice joined the first. He made it out to the corridor where he watched two men fight free of the paramedics and a lone police officer to grapple with each other. A security guard ran past Jared as the men threw punches that landed with earnest thuds. Jared covered his mouth as he started to heave. He pushed open the heavy bathroom door and threw up into the toilet. Blood, bright red against the white enamel, diffused in tendrils in the water, copper in his mouth. The muscles in his throat clenched and released until he threw up again, this time a stew of blood in chunks. His stomach burned, a hot pain like accidentally swallowing a live coal. The searing intensified until it was as if he'd swallowed the whole barbecue pit. Oh God, Jared thought, I'm dying. Thank you. Thank you. It, that was Did one I of my- disappear? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> finished reading for a sec, right? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, I think my, I think, <laughs> I think my internet is stable, stabilizing. Can we try the video? We would love that. Hey! Oh. <laughs> nice to actually see you. People wanted to see you too. Well. <laughs> we have to celebrate all the little things right now, don't we? <laughs> uh, my, inter my internet is telling me my bandwidth is low. So I may not last in the visual for long. Totally fine. We're, we'll savor the image of you while we can. <laughs> I'll give him 
to my apartment. I'm in Kitimat Village, which is 500 miles north of Vancouver on the BC coast. Uh, I'm on my father's razor. He is, uh, let's see, uh, this this is, um, uh, it was traditionally called Smotsa, uh, which means snag beach. <laughs> Uh, the the Kitimat River would wash down like old stumps, so the entire beach is covered in these these huge, like uh, Lovecraftian creature, like stumps. They're they're giants. Yeah, it's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> just connecting back to your your bit you just read, I love how in these books you have. Like Jared's going to AA and he's trying to get saner, but it gets crazier. And then the <laughs> and he pretends that he was like super hungover and it was ma like a magic hangover and he's sloppy yeah. dead instead of sloppy drunk. Because <laughs> he's doing the right thing, right? He's going to program. Yeah. He's going to have it with yeah. Coda and they're having their lattes and cookies and being yeah. accountable to each other. And it just gets worse and worse for this poor kid. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> Pardon? Was that on purpose? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, in the, in the third book, um, it, it's the absolute lowest point. It's, it's you know, he's, there is, um you know I think throughout the entire series like he's had he's definitely had some low points he's had some like super crazy and low points but in the third novel it's you know everything is on the floor like um and the only thing holding him together are the connections that he's made with other people in the first and the second book uh, so his family and his found family are the ones that, uh, that help him through this really challenging time. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, well, in the first draft that I, yeah, in the first draft that I wrote, um, uh, it was, it was a very gentle draft. Like I, I wrote it in the before times. Uh, and you know there wasn't really a deadline I was just writing it like every morning and taking my time and really enjoying it uh, and when I got feedback from my editor she was like well it's, it's really nice but kind of boring uh, and because you know everyone was talking things out and uh, everyone was healing and nothing bad happened to anybody <laughs> You fix that. <laughs> well, that's what I tell people. That's what I tell people about. Yeah, it was how much I yeah, like this book because it's the, so yeah, cozy. By the time I got the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh no worries, no worries. I, I think we're. I think it's just the connection. <laughs> you added in all the action and the horror and the re-eating and losing limbs you're very obedient to your editor in the, in the second yes in the second in the second draft uh by then i was back at campbell river and i was in the hick brown house and uh, that was the time when they, uh, be just before they canceled Canada Reads, just before, you know, we discovered um, just how infectious COVID is. <laughs> so uh, I had gone out to Toronto for Canada Reads and, you know, met the other writers and the other defenders and my defender. And that evening I met with my editor and she gave me my notes for my book. And uh, we chatted about this, how, you know, uh, a plan for restructuring. And uh, then I flew back to Campbell River. And uh, part of the writer and residency duties are like visiting classrooms. So during one of my class visits, uh, the, the, one of the students had gone to her dentist. 
and her dentist had gone to a conference in Vancouver that turned out to be a super spreader event. <laughs> so uh, I got a phone call that, that I needed to quarantine for two weeks and that, um, you know, I couldn't go in to get a test because they were rationing them for the health career workers at that point. Uh, and if you, if you know Hey Brown House, it's a lovely two acre lot with gardens and a park on one side and the river and the highway. So I have uh, like horrible, horrible seasonal allergies. So I was just, you know, I was coughing and dripping and, uh, you know, uh, being, because it is that time of a woman's life when she permanently has her own private summer. Um, <laughs> whenever I took my temperature, it was like 39 or 40. <laughs> so I didn't know if I had COVID and was going to die or if it was just allergies and menopause. Uh, so that was the mood that I wrote the second draft in and everybody died. Like on the, like every single person in the book died. And at the very, <laughs> and on the very last page, uh, Jared died. Oh, uh, no. he bled out on the he bled out on the ground, and <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better. So, so when my <laughs> so when my third draft. Um, uh, I had, you know, the residency ended, I took the ferry home, I honked by my mom's house when I got here, so that I could let her know that I had arrived safely, I unloaded, and I had to quarantine again for, for two weeks, but it was a very different quarantine, because, um, like, my, my cousins would leave me, like, little care packages, like fresh fish, fresh clams. There's there's a bunch of people in my family who are celiac as well. So they would leave me little gluten-free things that they had baked. Uh, one of my cousins makes just incredible gluten-free banana bread. Cool. So that was the mood that was, so here in my apartment, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, it was, it was a very, different rewrite so the final the rewrite is basically what you have right now like the, the novel that is um and there's <laughs> it's uh my editor called it the goldilocks version <laughs> this really dovetails nicely into priscilla's question she says can you tell us about what it was like to write the final book when you had such positive feedback on the previous books and characters? I read that you wanted all the characters to have a happy ending mm -hmm. most of the time. How did you get to a place beyond that wish? I, um, yeah, that, that was strictly COVID. <laughs> It was just the, you know, the circumstances around writing the second draft were a little brutal. Uh, so I think if, if I hadn't had that scare, um, you know, cause, cause we, I did my two weeks of self of quarantine from the middle of February to April, and then we went into lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, like, if you remember back to the beginning of the pandemic, it was like a, a constant feeling of dread and anxiety and worry. Uh, and that's the mood, that's the, the whole mood of the world while I was writing the second draft. So I think without that, you would have got a, a very different novel, like it would have been a, a novel more about, um, you know, uh, the way Jared was dealing with his his personal issues. Yeah, because Jared is worried the whole novel, and he like like us right now. He's just trying. He's trying to do the best things to protect his family and the people he cares about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot more cannibalism than I was expecting. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about your novels is they're very <laughs> it was 
it was um, like the the like the middle section of the novel where things go completely insane. Um, well, you know, they started kind of crazy with the with the organ roundup in the first chapter, uh, and then they calmed down and then they geared up again. Um, and it was it was you know that part was written. Like, I think I was just trying to process a lot of different emotions and that's how it came out. <laughs> so a related question from the Q&A. Caitlin asks, thanks, she says, thanks for being here today, Eden. You put your characters through the ringer, but in ways that are very true to life. I'm wondering how you maintain your own mental health as you dive deep into dark themes, or if that's too personal, any advice for a novice writer who keeps breaking her own heart? Oh, well, I hope you keep writing from your heart. I, um, I, the thing that I love about being a writer is that my job helps me process the world. I, I don't know how non-writers do it. I don't know how non-writers deal with like the, like when you listen to the news and it's just relentlessly grim. And, you know, you hear about like your, you know, your friends and your family passing and, you know, then you, you, know, you hear the things about the hospital and the variants and, you know, we might not catch, you know, all that, like, and, and the circumstances at home, like, you know, I know a lot of my friends have uh, young children and they're also taking care of their, you know, their parents, so. Uh, you know, they're sandwiched under this incredible stress because they're working from home. Uh, you know, as a writer, I deal with this by writing. Like, I, I talk it through on paper. Um, and I know most writers are, you know, this is how it, it's, it's, it's not quite therapy. Like, you, like, there's, there's a difference between uh, like writing strictly for you and writing for an audience. Um, but no matter what you do, you know, you're exploring your own head. You're exploring the, the things that you think and you're trying to like place yourself in your fictional world. And that helps you place yourself in the real world. I think that's a great answer. Uh, we have another run from our Q&A. Are you Aunt Maeve? Mm -hmm. Are you Aunt Maeve? Mm -hmm. Yes. You are? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Parts of me are Aunt Maeve. Like, uh, I decided that she should be a writer. Um, and she should definitely have some of my quirks. Uh, but she quickly became like uh, uh, something beyond me. Like my, my absolute favorite part was uh, like when Jared let her ride his Vespa and, you know, let her ride around it. And she, you know, I've always loved Vespas. Uh, they're not really practical for here. <laughs> I used to have all them now. So I know. <laughs> And the rain and the you know we, we've got like a very small window for Vespa riding and but I've always wanted one like I've always also wanted like a Mini Cooper I love so I gave her like the things that I want like a uh, the VW Bug uh, like her passion for the Canucks it's like yay they're finally winning yay uh, and it was very scary watching them go through the COVID stuff huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those those things are me, but uh, like the sartorial resistance, where uh, you know that poster of her in the shop, like that's that's all her. Like she, that's based on some of the kick-ass aunties that I know, um, and you know her her personality became um, not mine. Like she became. Um, much more uh like much more of an activist much more of a uh, but you know that the <laughs> that intrusive antiness that's that's 
that is me. <laughs> I, a lot of I am definitely. Yeah, you, that's her, you. That's you. Your matriarchal tendencies are showing. <laughs> well, my, my sister would say that I was always like a bossy older sister. And uh, my older brother agrees with her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was, I was a caretaker for my dad. Like he had Parkinson's. Well, I was a, care was a part of his care team. Yeah. And he would get really annoyed when I told him what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes when my when my niece is helping me out and she tells me what to do, I, I suddenly realize just how I sounded to dad. <laughs> so I'm trying to let go of that, uh, you know, the bossy middle child thing that I have going, but um, and it's it's getting easier as I get older and you know people have to live their own lives and make their own mistakes and figure things out by themselves um, and uh, yeah so it, it's not exactly zen it's more that you know I'm just tired <laughs> I'm yeah. older and I didn't have as much energy as I used to have <laughs> I think we'd all like to go to Aunt Maeve's for uh, an organic turkey <laughs> bucks out of the freezer. <laughs> oh, that, that was the oh, first time I just oh, laughed and laughed because yeah. I may, may have done that before. <laughs> we, we've got a few more. Everybody relates to parts of your novels. It's just which parts, right? And thank you for finally writing a yeah. Sasquatch landlord character for us. I think that speaks to a very specific <laughs> person. How did the you get have a Hugan Sasquatch or a man of the woods? Uh, my dad, uh, like he was still with us when Son of a Trickster came out. And he read it and he liked it, but he was very disappointed because there were no Sasquatches in that. And um, he he said, you know, like you've got tricksters, like where are the Sasquatches? Uh, and I had already finished the, the draft. I had already sent in, and, and it had been accepted, like trickster draft. So I decided that for the third book, I would have like a gratuitous Sasquatch scene. <laughs> Uh, and I had um, I had to Whistler with my niece and nephew. Like I, I brought them up because they absolutely love snowboarding. And um, the like uh, I have a, a terrible sense of direction. So like yeah, getting us from like the, the hotel near the near the ski, the gondola thingies. Uh, like it was a ski in ski out like rental uh, but it just meant that we were far from everything so I would like drive us places and I had a like a GPS thing and my phone but I would still get us lost <laughs> <laughs> and like uh, in one of our wanders uh, I, I saw this amazing house and it was like for sale, so I took a picture, and my sister suggested I look it up, look it up on the real estate thing, and so I did. I thought it would be a perfect house for a Sasquatch, um, and you know, so I had him be like one of Weget's oldest friends, uh, because Weget and Anita really are the fighty Raz couple. Like they, like every time they had a big blowout. Uh, we get we go and stay with with Chuck, and Chuck, uh, you know, he was so much fun to write. He was uh, like up and up and down the coast. There are so many different variations of Bugwas. Uh, in in Highsla, he's Bugwas the the wild man of the woods, 
and like on the coast, you know, uh, he he's more of a like a uh, like a gentle figure. But as you go further into the interior of BC, like he's he he's a lot more scary and tends to like you know be more directly eating people. Um, <laughs> I thought it would be hard for Jared to be friends with, a, you know, someone that ate people. So I made him a human, uh, yep. which means he doesn't eat humans anymore. Well, Jared's a pretty nice person. <laughs> and because he's... Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it made sense, like, as I was writing him into the novel, um, like one of my editor's feedback was like, you can't drop a character like this into the book and not use them again. So that's when he had the, so that's when I put in another scene towards the end where he goes and <laughs> he introduces Maeve to the supernatural world. <laughs> yeah this is completely bananas and one of the uh like I love to take my my uh, mom and dad with me when I would do my author tours just so you know just just because you know I always travel with an entourage <laughs> and dad loved uh Cathedral Grove near Port Alberni uh and there was this huge stump and it was, it was just, you know, it was bigger than a lot of trees. And, you know, he said, well, that's why you don't see Sasquatches because they can turn themselves into stumps to avoid being detected. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, so that's, that's why that scene is there at the end. It was just, you know, I was trying to figure out like what for, what Chuck would do if he was really upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah my, my poor editor he had to, she had to uh explain the book to marketing <laughs> it's definitely different well there's and that's what we love about <laughs> <laughs> yeah she says yeah it's definitely an Eden Robinson book <laughs> yeah. and there is no other so that's great you've got job security <laughs> <laughs> yeah all, all the weird little bits of my brain are like it's like you know okay you know this week I'm obsessed with magnetars and you know and then the next week it's like magnetars are done <laughs> blazars <laughs> we've got a question I put this in my book we've got a question here about yes. how did Jared's voice come to you as a teenage mm. boy well when I first started um, when I first started writing, uh, again, I was writing a trashy band council romance. So I was, I was moving into uh, middle age drama. <laughs> uh, but I was having a lot of difficulty because a trashy band council romance demands multiple narrators. And up to this point in my writing career, I've never worked with multiple narrators before. I've always had like a singular point of view, either in first person or third person limited. Like you're either in their head or on their shoulder. So, so it quickly sprawled. I had no control over it. It was just wandering everywhere. It was really hard to corral the characters. Um, and I, I I just didn't know how to work with it. So I decided to read a lot of uh, books that had multiple narrators. And while this was happening, my niece and nephew were visiting and my dad tried to tell them a wicked story. And they were really interested in it. And they, they loved that he told it to them, but you know, they had grown up um, near their father's reserve in Brantford. So they didn't have any context for uh, the wicked stories and they didn't find them funny the way that I had found them funny. So I decided to write a short story contextualizing trickster, like our trickster we get to 
try, you know, let them see how he was funny. And um, at first I was writing it from Wicket's point of view, but he was like, you know, it's kind of like having Sherlock narrate a Sherlock Holmes story. It got braggy and, you know, it was, it was, it just it wasn't working. So I knew I needed a Watson. So the first, the, the next narrator I tried was Maggie, Jared's mother. Um, Too much swearing. But she was pretty fighty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very creative swearing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but it was, you know, but it was just fight, fight, fight. Um, so I thought, well, you know, there, I had tried to write a collection of interconnected short stories about the rise and fall of an intertribal urban dance group. Um, sort of like the commitments in East Vancouver. And it <laughs> stalled out pretty fast. So I got a couple of short stories done and then realized that, you know, I wasn't ready to write it. Uh, but one of the fragments that came out of that was uh, a story about a young man arriving in Vancouver on the Greyhound bus late at night. It was very lonely and it haunted me. So once I took that fragment and put it into the trickster world, uh, it became Jared. And, you know, once I found my narrator, like I always know it's my narrator because it quickly went to 50 pages. And I realized it was probably a novella. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I have a lot of like uh, young people in my life. Um, and for, for Monkey Beach, I had toured the schools in Northern BC in support of a pilot program. And I met a lot of Jareds. Uh, there are, you know, a lot of big hearted kids in really hard circumstances, uh, just trying to hold their families together. And they were a huge inspiration for Jared. Yeah, my, I should acknowledge that my, my teen, Teen consultants for the Trickster series were, were my niece and nephew. Um, she was, you know, uh, they were really annoyed that I had Jared on Facebook. Uh, they, they said that one cool is on Facebook, they sh he should be on, uh, <laughs> you know, he should either be on Instagram or Snapchat. And uh, they, they were trying to show me Snapchat, but I, I just didn't get it. It was like, it was, it was a step. That was when I knew that I was probably not going to write another teen novel. <laughs> it was like, you know, they were, they were taking videos of me and, you know, and they didn't, they were ephemeral. They didn't last. I was like, I really, uh, and then they, they showed me like the map where you could see all their friends. And it's like, that's super creepy. Like, you know, that's, that's, I don't like that. And they're, they're like, oh, Angie. <laughs> they said, well, I'll keep him on Facebook just because he's trying to stay in touch with his mother. And, you know, um, and they were like, yeah, well, we told you. <laughs> Your character has stalkers. He can't be like, visible on a map. Uh, Snapchat, yeah, you can see you can see your friend's locations. I think you can oh. shut it off, but you know, David would of, find him in two seconds, part, so you could see. Yes. <laughs> Ruin the narrative structure of your book. <laughs> um, we have a lot of people who are very interested in your trashy um, band council novel, but are you working on anything new? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the trashy band council romance, uh, that's the one that my mother wants me to finish. She's like, trickster, whatever, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 just, uh, <laughs> my internet just crashed. That's the I, reality of our modern life. So we were just yeah. talking about your future projects. Oh, well, um, the, the Trishy Band Council romance, uh, as I wrote it, like uh, the two mains that are having the trashy romance are the environmental manager and the housing manager. 
Oh. Uh, so the environmental manager was working at the AFN in Ottawa, became disillusioned with the politics and decided to move home to help his community. Uh, so his wife didn't want to leave Ottawa and really didn't want to move back to Kitimat. So she, so they got divorced. You know, their, their marriage had been strained for quite a while. Um, so she's dating a guy who's on one of the Ottawa Senator farm teams and his kids absolutely love hockey. Like they just love it. So they've adopted their stepdad uh, and he's feeling like very, um, you know, just just abandoned. And, uh, he's been carrying a torch for the housing manager since high school. And uh, her husband is the coup, the chief operating officer, and his brother is the chief counselor. So it's an election year. And um, I, she, the housing manager, like the chapter one starts with, um, yeah, chapter one starts with uh, uh, the housing manager suspecting one of the counselors of stealing her lunch. Like uh, every time that counselor is in the office, her lunch goes missing. So, uh, so she's been putting a bait lunch in the in the work fridge for a week, and on the day of the housing budget meeting. Uh, she, she steals one of her daughter's pot brownies and puts it in a Ziploc bag. <gasps> <laughs> so she's expecting the counselor to just get like really high. But instead, during the meeting, she starts throwing up and then falls to the ground. And um, uh, yeah, so... Uh, one of the uh, one of the volunteer firemen is training to be a paramedic, so he breaks out his naloxone kit, and you know eventually. <laughs> this sounds fun. I'm here for it. <laughs> so you know, so her husband asks her if she can not poison the counselors during an election year. And she asks if he cannot park his Jeep in her cousin's driveway all night. So that's chapter oh, one. Oh. <laughs> okay. It's not even a different tone from this trilogy. <laughs> well, my um, I'm really good at like every every writer has their gift. Like, uh, I'm really, you know, I'm good with dialogue. I'm good with menacing moods. And, okay. you know, I'm good with violence. What's this I'm book good. called? Uh, well, because, you know, the traditional name is um, Smoke So I was thinking of going with Stag Beach. And then the subtitle could be A Trashy Band Council Romance. <laughs> Approved <laughs> by this audience. You know that, yeah, you know, hot robbing palsy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, the, the whole, um, you know, but, but I don't really have, like, I'm not a romantic person myself. I'm incredibly practical. So I, I can't really write a, a real romance novel, but I can write a trashy romance novel. <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, you know, my sister has offered to like because yeah, I have to offer to ghostwrite the the sex scenes for me because she oh. says mine are good but they're not really hot. So, um, and, <laughs> so I said, well, I wouldn't want you to ghostwrite. I, 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 you know, I could say that you know you helped write the like the sex scenes or you wrote the sex scenes. You know, we, we'd figure it out when the time came. It uh, sounds so. like you don't let yourself be boxed <laughs> in by genres. Is yes. what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So you know, we could we could, and you know, uh, but when I was first deciding what to write next, like um, 
you know, I, I usually tend, like anything that's set in a real place, I tend to talk it out with like, you know, the people that it would affect. So I was starting to talk to my cousins who worked in the band council saying, well, you know, this is, you know, this is what I'm thinking of writing. Uh, you know, what do you think? And most of them started, you know, telling me about, you know, the gossip that they heard. And there, some of the cousins started calling me weekly to update me on the, the band council. <laughs> No, no, I don't need any more. <laughs> not research complete. <laughs> Problem is, I have too much material. <laughs> yeah. And then you are get told by your editor to simplify your storyline again. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, I think I would have to just like um, let the family be as complex as yeah, like it is in real life because it's, it's on the rest, like everyone's. Um, you know, and some people, uh, you know, <laughs> have very large families, <laughs> like myself. <laughs> so, you know, so I don't know, like, I think we would have to come with like a pull out map of genealogies, like, so, you know, like, and, but more importantly, like, like my mom is a huge, huge resource when it comes to mapping up genealogy. She's amazing at remembering family history. Yeah. But what's even more impressive is that not only can she remember the like every single name, she can remember all the scandals attached. <laughs> to the names. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> so I think I would be leaning on her heavily for the trashy bank council formats. <laughs> well, we look forward to its fruition, whatever form that is. Uh, nobody can say you don't have a rich cast of characters. We have a question specifically about Maggie. Where did she yeah. come from? Oh, Maggie. Well, she is one of those characters that is just like, you know, like I have a lot of a very tough family and you know they're they're pretty ready to you know ready to rumble and you know I've always admired that I've always and um, when I was writing the first draft of Trickster uh, she was supposed to be a walk-on character like she was supposed to be in a flashback of Jared's high school and it was you know it was just you know, the relationship had so many layers and it was surprisingly tender at times. Like they annoyed the hell out of each other, but underneath all of it, like they really, really, really love each other. Um, and so she stayed, she, when she stayed, like the complexity of both of them uh, was revealed in the way that they, you know, interacted. And in the third book, like the relationship completely changes, not because of like anything Maggie's doing, but just because Jared has come to see his parents as actual people, not just mom and dad. So he's, you know, he's not expecting them to be his parents so much as he's expecting them to be people and that shifts their dynamic and their relationship and you know it was it was wonderful to see it evolving and it was wonderful to have that kind of interaction um you know that that huge sea change for them was incredible uh, it was so exciting and I also loved um uh, the way like, uh, Nana Sophia, like she, like when she discovered that she wasn't Jared's biological grandmother, like she, that was supposed to be the end of it. Like I remember when I wrote that scene, like I didn't want to write it. I had it off screen for the first couple of drafts. And in the end, I knew that I had to write it. And uh, so I saved it for a morning when I had a lot of energy. And um, back then, like I would leave my my door open so dad could come over for coffee in the morning. Um, so, you know, so I wrote the scene and I'm a method writer. So if my writers are crying, uh, if my characters are crying, I'm probably crying too. So, uh, you know, I, I was just a math 
I was weeping and dad came in and he thought someone had died uh, and he was asking me what was wrong you know who was hurt and I was like I was explaining to him that it was a you know character and she found out that she wasn't Jared's uh, grandmother and you know she left and she wasn't coming back and <laughs> it's like he was like yeah you don't really have to do this to yourself the band council is always looking for receptionists <laughs> Let me be a little less emotionally invested in every other. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> well, thank you for making her love Jared again at the end. That was a really oh. cool afterward. Because I, I was like, just, ugh. <laughs> and, and I tell people about your book characters when I'm reading them. Like, and they're like, that's in your book, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I did this other thing. And then Jared wore these Power Ranger pajamas so they could find him. <laughs> so um, you shared the crazy. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, like, and thank you to everyone for coming. I, 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 you know, I'm happy to hang around for a little bit longer, but, uh, you know, if you guys have any more questions you'd like answered that would be could we hang out for another 10 minutes would that be okay i would love that okay we would love to have you <laughs> um okay meg says super specific question i'd love to know the motivation for jared wanting to be a medical sonographer great career choice <laughs> <laughs> well that would that came from a deleted scene Okay. Uh, yeah, that was um, in in one of the first drafts. Like he was going over his career options with a guidance counselor, and you know he wanted to have you know Jared was like listing what he wanted, and he wanted a job that was you know um, you know wouldn't require like a couple of degrees it wouldn't require this wouldn't require that and uh so we gave him a list of of you know possible career choices and medical sonographer like he liked the idea of being a, a, a like a kind of a behind the scenes guy like he you know he didn't want to be a technician um or be like he didn't he didn't want to like because like his dad had worked in so many resource industries that collapsed when the commodity markets changed he didn't want to have something that was dependent on you know the price of commodities so uh you know and he knew that he you know there, there were certain things that would fit his personality um and the career the guidance counselor really wanted him to be a chef because you know he because he was famous for his cookies <laughs> <laughs> or you know you know a baker or and you know Jared had worked in like the food industry before so he was like no <laughs> and you know the hours of the you know bakery hours are kind of insane so he yeah. didn't really want to do that yeah he wanted something like safe and stable and you know that that really struck him as something that he could do that makes um, a lot so, of so it's yeah yeah it, it was a it was quite a random choice <laughs> and I, you know i learned a lot like bcit is one of the places that offers it and there's i think there's another one in state uh in calgary but they're they're mostly for uh like uh they, they i think they focus on like um yeah it, it was a different focus and so it was it was you know I I love I love doing those parts of writing because you get to you know you get to nose around and call it research uh <laughs> it's not progressing it's research <laughs> My yeah I can get that to you so we got it <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> it's not helping them. <laughs> uh, oh my 
my favorite. I have a question, and so does somebody else. They they're kind of the same question. Will there be like a twenty years later re-return of the Trickster type book? Because we're I miss. <laughs> um i'm not sure uh like i i know when a book is done when i wake up and i don't think about it anymore it's not the first thing that i think of you've got 20 uh, years so just yeah yeah i've also i also thought that i would like to write on like each follow-up but that hasn't happened it's been 20 years <laughs> <laughs> so you know there have been a lot of fan requests like i said for we get um um we get um chuck in the 70s uh so <laughs> can, be, you could write a baby series of band council romance books <laughs> just trying to help I to, yeah i would love to see chuck in a band council <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we get would have the patience for policy. Uh <laughs> oh, on the topic of research, what's your favorite thing you discovered during your research that you weren't able to use and you'd love oh. to know about? Oh, oh my goodness. There were so many things. Um, there were like, like just just so many things about um, uh, magic and Chuck and um, you know the the thing that hurt the most was like I was really obsessed with starfish for about three months and I was trying to cram in like some starfish knowledge. <laughs> Very cool. They can regrow just from their central disc. I bet you. Yes. Know yes. Yes. And some of them like extrude their stomachs. Like they, like they, like force, like they do a little, like they open up like the clamor cockle just enough that they can put their stomach in there and they eat like the clamor cockle, like outside of, they digest it outside of their body and then suck it back in. That I think so. <laughs> I'm sure the audience just learned that, but apparently you and I both know weird things about sea stars. So that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, like uh, I was like some of the later research on the starfish wasting disease. Yeah, uh, yeah. the sea star wasting disease is like it might just be deoxygenization, deoxygenization that kills them, not the actual virus. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's super interesting. It is. Thank you. Yeah. No one else that was reading it thought it was. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. You had Bob the octopus, and he was just, like, he was little, like, was like post. We're coast people. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And there was like, you know, there were so many threads that I couldn't fit in. Like, like the problem with the first draft was that, like. Uh, like Justice had her own backstory. Like her grandfather was someone that fought bad magic, and like all the furniture that he left her, he knew that she would eventually need for fighting bad magic herself. But it required so much um, backstory that it was, you know, and it wasn't really essential to the current narrative. Um, like if I had gone on with the trickster series, like Justice would have been exploring that a lot more. Uh, Coda had a lot more scenes with his boyfriend, like, um, uh, you know, like it was like he, his boyfriend really liked, um, you know, having, it, it was just, you know, and there was, you know, there were a lot more scenes with Sophia. But, you know, by the third book, like, I had started to understand plot. <laughs> well, I, this is a trilogy like Lord of the Rings. You could do, like, an extended edition book. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, like, 
872 pages and we love every second <laughs> well i have put some of the deleted scenes in the sfu special collection so if you're cool. really curious about it yeah yeah there's a couple of them in there uh other ones you know i'll yeah, I'll see what happens, but I, I pretty well think that uh, the trilogies, like I was worried that I would Douglas Adams it and have like, you know, five books in the trilogy. You <laughs> <laughs> would have been playing, though. <laughs> so a sim similar themed question, will the otters make another appearance in future writings? Oh, I would love that. Like they're, um, yeah, they're, they got cut right back as well. Uh, because Jared had figured out how to, uh, cause it's, you know, Jared's liver is really unhappy with this role. Um, so like when Jared gets enough of his magic back, um, uh, you know, him and his liver make a deal where, uh, you know, if if the liver becomes like a transformational skin for the otters, um, you know it can leave Jared's body, and so so the otters regain their ability to go back to the ocean. I'll, you know, but one at a time. So the first person that goes back to the ocean is their their grandma, and um, you know we I I tried to ram that in. <laughs> But it just, you know, it, it would have had to take place like in about 50 years because, you know, Jared really did blow through a lot of magic. Like, um, and he he won't have the ability to do that for at least 50 years. Uh, but, you know, I thought it could be like, like if like one of those Harry Potter moments where <laughs> you get a glimpse of the characters like much later. But, it, it, you know, no, no way that I tried to put it in there worked, but that was that was like that was what was in my head when we had the liver yearning to be free. <laughs> Fair, um, yeah. Oh, thanks for trying to fit it in. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question: Is there any way to transform from human form to raven form without losing your phone or getting naked? <laughs> you have to bust all your clothes and lose your phone. <laughs> you would you would always lose your phones. And, uh ravens and clothes make it really hard to fly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So like yeah, an you can like an Yeah, once you 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 can dress birds in clothes, but they don't really like it. No. Um. <laughs> you have to carefully undress in your human form fold up your clothes put your yes. phone down and then do it yeah okay yes yes you're always you know you're gonna have to like like if you're going to like if you know you're going to be transforming you could probably use a burner phone <laughs> i just feel so bad for jared losing his phone <laughs> i know i know and he was so happy to have like an iphone too <laughs> <laughs> I want to do so like yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, you know, there was also like there was more with David. Like he he actually was like uh, it's a he, you know he's a the supernatural character that he is 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 similar to um like he's one of the children of hell. So like one of the great, great, great grandchildren of hell. So he's, you know, dealing with the dead. So, you know, once, once he passed, he would, you know, it, it was, it was all complex and glorious, but, but it didn't really, it didn't work it as well. So he just, you know, once, once he was dead in the book, like that was it. Um, otherwise it, 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 the, you know, the, it, it could have, you know, been like, like with all the stuff that was in like the drafts. It could have been a thousand pages, but um, <laughs> it would have been Tolkien esque. <laughs> made your own world, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, 
we've had so many comments um about he how healing it is to hear your laughter oh thank you God. is to hear your voice and uh, and people appreciating your knowledge of ocean creatures a suggestion that perhaps you might want to write a non-fiction piece about aquatic themes i think that's an actual question oh. is that something that's in the works for you at all any non-fiction uh, not at the moment but i know that there's like a like one of the young women from Hartley Bay was asking if I could like help her start writing like her book. Like she's she's doing some research into the local whales. And you know, I think I could help that way because I can't help with her whale research, but I can help with like the writing bits. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, well we have so loved having you here um thank oh. you for bringing these wonderful characters and your zany sense of humor and all the magic of that <laughs> world to us we would love if you came you know just keep writing for us that's all we ask i think oh thank you <laughs> Harlequin for your bound council romance series and we will buy those from you <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. This was wonderful. And, you know, uh, I can't wait to come back to Vancouver. We'd love to have you in person post-pandemic. That, oh, that would be amazing. And then you can that sign all of our books. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Get your, your arm already, okay? <laughs> I, I have silver sharpies specifically for the black pages. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So a reminder to everybody, you can purchase your books through strongnations.com um, or your local bookstore and um, keep, hold Eden close and share her with other people. We had some comments in the chat about people sharing book your books with a family during the pandemic to bring that love and light into their lives in their hands so thank you so much um Heichka, and hope you uh, enjoy your garden <laughs> thank you have a good weekend everyone Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> thank you Eden. thanks everybody for coming we really appreciate your time thank you guys bye